Come join me by my fire, and I'll tell you all a tale. Come sit and warm yourself with a cup of mead or ale. These tales of old, if they're not told, could soon be lost to time. But a story shared between us becomes yours as well as mine. Loki paid a hefty price for his misdeeds and insults of the gods. A hefty price indeed. He pays that price still to this very day and will for many more to come. But Loki had been a friend of the gods. A trickster, certainly. A troublemaker, even. Yet he also helped the gods and had great adventures with Thor. And he knew the gods well. He knew they would not forgive his dark deeds, nor his slanderous words. And he knew well the depth of punishments that they were capable of handing out. What could have made him do and say such wicked things to his friends? And what could have made him risk such harsh punishment by admitting his misdeeds? What could plant such anger and hate in a man's heart, lest we forget Loki had children. Loki was not born of the Aesir. Indeed, his father was the giant Farbauti, and his mother the giantess Laufe. Only the Allfather could say why. But Loki was adopted into the Aesir as kin. Odin and Loki shared their blood and became brothers. And Odin swore an oath that he would forevermore accept no drink that was not also offered to Loki. He would come to regret that oath. Loki took a wife, Sigyn, and she bore him two sons, Vali and Narfi. But Loki had other children as well. There lived deep in Jotunheim a giantess named Angrabota, and she bore Loki three children. But these were not like his other sons. They were not like the gods, nor even like their Jotun parents. The first child was a wolf, whom they called Fenrir. The second child was a venomous serpent, whom they called Jormungandr. And the third was a girl they named Hel. Half of her body was bluish black, and the other half was flesh-colored, and her gaze was fierce and somber. The children were raised solely by their mother in Jotunheim for a short while, until the gods learned of them, and learned through prophecy that these children would bring great misfortune to the gods. And so the Allfather sent some of the Aesir into Jotunheim to bring the children to him. Seeing the children, it was determined that with the prophecy, and considering who their mother and father were, there was too much potential for great ill if they were left to their own devices. And so Odin cast Jormungandr into the great sea that surrounds the world. And he grew and grew to such a great size that his scaly body wrapped around the entire world and he could bite his own tail. Hell, he sent down into Niflheim, and though she was to stay there, he granted her great power over all the nine worlds, for she takes charge of those who die of sickness or old age throughout the worlds. She has a great hall called Ayulthnir, or sleet sprayed. Her dish is called hunger, her knife is famine. Idler, her thrall, Slaven, her maidservant. The threshold to her hall is called Stumbling Block, and her bed is called Disease, and her bed hangings Gleaming Bale. Despite all of this, and her half bluish black complexion, her hall is a place of rest for the dead, and should not be feared. The wolf the Aesir brought home to raise, 
but only Tyr dared approach close enough to feed it. And so he himself raised Fenrir. But the gods saw how fast he grew and how fearsome he was becoming. All the prophecies said that he would be their destruction. And so they resolved to bind him. The gods crafted a strong fetter, which they named Leidinger, and they brought it to Fenrir. They dared him to test his strength against it. Well, the wolf felt this would be an easy challenge, and he allowed the gods to bind him. With one great strain, he broke Leidinger and freed himself. He was congratulated on his strength, but the gods then went and made a new fetter, stronger than Leidinger by at least half, and they called it Dromi. They dared the wolf again, saying he would gain great fame and renown if he was stronger than such fine craftsmanship. Fenrir examined it. It seemed to be much stronger than Leidinger. But then again, he had grown in strength since that first test as well. But he knew that if he wished to gain fame and renown, he must take risks. And so he allowed the Aesir to bind him for a second time. When the gods finished, he strained and thrashed, striking the fetter against the ground with such force that bits of it flew off, and he freed himself from Dromi. Since that day, the people have used the phrases to get loose from Leidinger, or to dash out of Dromi, to describe doing something that is very difficult. The gods began to fear that they might never be able to bind Fenrir. So Odin sent Freyr's messenger, Skirnir, down to Svartalfheim to consult some dwarves who dwelt there. The dwarves created a new fetter for the wolf from magical, mystical things. They crafted it from the sound of a cat's footfalls, from a woman's beard, the roots of a rock, the sinews of a bear, the breath of a fish, and the spittle of a bird. They named it Gleipnir. Now, I know this must not make much sense to you, my friends, but surely you have noticed that a cat can make no sound with its steps, and that a woman has no beard. By my word, Gleipnir is made of these things, even though it is impossible to prove it to you. Gleipnir was soft and smooth as a silken ribbon, but was it strong enough? Skirnir brought it back to the gods, and they took it to the lake Amsvartnir and rode out to an island called Lingvi. They called for Fenrir to join them. They showed Fenrir the ribbon and dared him to break it as before, saying that it was somewhat stronger than it appeared. They passed it around, trying to break it with their hands. All the while saying that perhaps Fenrir had the strength to do so. I cannot imagine I would gain much glory from breaking a thin ribbon, replied the wolf. But if it was made with cunning and wiles, then it might never come off my feet. The Aesir assured him that he could surely snap a silken ribbon with ease. And if he could not, well, then they certainly had nothing to fear from him, and they would untie him. If I cannot free myself, I fear it would be a long time before you would help me. So I am reluctant to have this ribbon tied around my legs. But rather than have you question my courage, one of you place your hand in my mouth as a pledge of good faith that I will be released. Well, the gods looked at each other, quite reluctant to part with a hand. But then Tyr stepped forward, and he placed his hand between the jaws of that great wolf whom he had raised from a pup. The Aesir bound Fenrir's legs with Gleipnir, 
But when the wolf lashed out, the silken ribbon hardened like iron and tightened. The stronger he struggled, the tighter it became. Many gods laughed at the sight, but not Tyr, for he lost his right hand. When the Aesir were sure that the wolf was truly bound, they took a chain called Gelja, which was attached to the fetter, and passed it through a great rock called Gyol, and fixed it deep within the earth. They took another stone, Thviti, and drove it even deeper into the earth as a fastening pin. Fenrir could not believe this, and he tried to bite at the Aesir. And as a gag, a sword was thrust into his mouth, the hilt in his lower jaw and the point in his upper. And there he stands, howling horribly, drool running from his mouth to form the river van, until Ragnarok, when he will take his revenge. One might wonder why the Aesir did not simply kill Fenrir. But the gods valued their holy places and sanctuaries. And they would not defile them with the wolf's blood, even though the prophecies say that he will be the death of Odin. Perhaps Loki's anger at the gods was justified. He lost a son that day, and in a truly horrible way. It was a shameful act for the gods, an act born of fear. And who is to say that the wolf's prophesied destiny of killing the Allfather isn't really just revenge for this ill treatment? Who is to say that all of the dark events leading to Ragnarok don't all boil down to this dark day when the gods fought against a prophecy? Perhaps it was fighting the prophecy that will ultimately fulfill it. Who can say? What I will say is this, those holy gods, those wonderful and marvelous doers of great deeds, deeds of honor and courage, let fear make a shameful decision for them, as fear so often does. And it led to the death of Baldur. The hour has now grown late, and it's time for us to go. So press like and subscribe, so when a new tale comes, you'll know.